an undulating glass facade, a white dome. In the Parisian landscape, between Haussmann facades and 30s brick-built, low-cost housing units, modern architecture erupts. The home of the French Communist Party, built by Oscar Niemeyer between 1965 and 1980, a building where the architecture is an embodiment of political ambition. <laughs> When in 1965 the French Communist Party decided to build a new headquarters, it represented more than 20% of the vote. It numbered 300,000 members and millions of sympathizers. It was they who, during 15 years of repeated campaigns to raise subscriptions, financed the construction of the new building. The Communist Party wanted to bring the facilities dispersed among several Parisian buildings into a single centre. It needed offices and meeting rooms. But the leaders were also aware that their new building would be looked upon as a sign of the party's development, its relationship with Stalinism, its spirit of openness, its relationships with artists and intellectuals. So, to symbolise this openness, they offered the project to Oscar Niemeyer. He was a communist and Brazilian, the world-renowned architect of the new capital city, Brasilia. After the military coup d'etat in 1964 in his country, he lived in exile in France, where he was allowed to pursue his career thanks to the personal intervention of André Malraux and General de Gaulle. Niemeyer enthusiastically accepted the PCF's offer and formed a team with Jean de Roche, a young communist architect. Jean Prouvé was to design the facades. Niemeyer worked free of charge. The headquarters of the PCF gives this city an example of contemporary architecture, a tourist attraction. A new shape for a building, simple and without luxurious and superfluous finishes, the house of the worker. And the PCF headquarters will be not just a good example of architecture, but a marker for the socialist society. As a site for its building, the Communist Party owned a fine parcel of land in the northeast of Paris, in the Place du Colonel Fabien, part of the hill at the foot of the Bout de Chaumont, 5,000 square meters. This land had an interesting architectural and political history. On it stood the Trade Union House, the Workers' University, and the constructivist Konstantin Melnikov's Pavilion, a building representing the Soviet Union at the 1925 Decorative Arts Exhibition. Given to the French Communists at the end of the exhibition, then destroyed by the Nazis in 1942. Unlike the buildings surrounding and bordering the square, Niemeyer decided to set his edifice back to enhance its value. The main glazed facade stands on the top of the slope, with in front of it the dome that covers the large meeting room. The two volumes, all curves, built during two distinct stages of the building period, hold a dialogue with each other. On the now open, gentle slope, Niemeyer created a garden and an esplanade, generously providing an area for the public beside the square. Some months after work on the site ended, the garden was enclosed for security reasons. With its six stories, its two parallel facades and its two gable walls covered in white ceramic, the Communist Party building belongs to a well-known family type built to a repetitive pattern, a block on a longitudinal plan. According to the orthodoxies of modern architecture, the building is detached from the ground. It stands on only five supports, five massive pillars with only one exposed, there where the slope ends. The other four pillars are hardly visible only just emerging from the concrete floor that rises up like a wave. This movement of the base is not due to the terrain, 
It is a creation of the architect accentuated by the design of the building's plinth, shaped like an upside-down aeroplane wing opening a space. The building seems to float on a thin layer of air. In the alignment of the five pillars rising from the ground, the load-bearing structure is set in the centre of the building. At each level, two inverted aeroplane wing profiles projecting from either side of the central part are in tension with one another. In the vicinity of the façade, the concrete is less thick, invisible from the outside. Neither of the two facades is load-bearing, and so they are glazed. 500 square metres made up of 324 sheets of glass, all the same size. To smarten the glazed area, the joints are as narrow as possible, made of rubber and inserted into a slender aluminium structure. Designed by Jean Prouvé, its unique creator, this is a successful example of what is known as a curtain wall. The building was to have been air-conditioned behind a hermetically sealed glass facade. But the Comrades did not want a building like the Americans. They preferred real comfort, windows that open. And the miracle happened. Prouvé developed a pivoting handle that enabled one in three windows in the glass facade to be opened. A well-designed simple aluminium handle. Light, handsome and efficient. In spite of its repetitive structure, the edifice is not like other longitudinal buildings. It undulates following a deceptively complex curve. The combination of two straight elements, a curve and a counter curve, adjusted at their tangent point. And the design of the Parisian edifice reproduces on a smaller scale the curve of the residential building that Niemeyer designed in 1951 at San Paolo, the Edificio Copan. There is a notable difference. The sun breakers for the Copan's facade are in concrete. In Paris, the curves are in glass. Curves that come from the juxtaposition of straight panes of glass. They break down the reflections of the sky and the Parisian landscape, and sometimes the facade of the building itself. Cloud watching has always been my favorite distraction. I saw cathedrals, warriors, animals, and all sorts of fantastic things in the clouds. I'm not drawn to right angles, nor straight lines, inflexible and created by man. What attracts me is the free and sensual curve. The curve that I meet in the mountains in my country, in the sinuous course of rivers, in clouds in the sky, in women's bodies, the whole world is made up of curves.
At the top of the site, the glass facade almost touches the wall of the low-cost housing estate, a huge stone wall pierced by little windows. These lights in the housing estate are secondary windows that should have been blocked up. The regulations required it. The architect preferred to install translucent panels. No prying eyes, but the light gets through. A delicacy on the part of the architect for good neighbourliness. At the rear of the building, Niemeyer changes his vocabulary and contrasts the glass facades with two solid volumes, opaque and monumental. There are no windows in the circular volume that contains the emergency stairs. The other, more imposing, trapezoidal volume houses the lifts and stairways. It is pierced by narrow loopholes, creating semi-darkness across the wide landings. By moving all the vertical traffic outside, the architect simplifies the lengthwise construction of the building and makes the stories flexible for future needs and reminds us of his taste for concrete. Following the curves of the facades, a central corridor winds through the middle of each floor. It serves some 20 offices on each side. An apparently commonplace program transformed by some astonishing choices. The corridor walls are not walls but store cupboards for the offices. Their coloured volumes punctuate the through pathway. Surrounded by glazed surfaces, the wall storage system lets in the daylight. In the offices, the glass wall is furnished with a storage shelf that runs along the facade, a guardrail that reduces feelings of vertigo. The fluorescent light tubes are set in the ceiling without joins or protection, just left bare. A discreet reminder by Niemeyer of his favoured brutal treatment of concrete. The top storey opens to the sky in two patios at each end of the building. Delicate curves sharing space with organic concrete volumes, protecting the air conditioning plant installed on the roof. A design coming at the end of the site work, a final invoice that the party would settle without question. A surprising vision in the Paris skyscape. In 1972, work on site stopped. Two neighbours were unwilling to move. For eight years, the emergency exit by the entry to the car park was the only way into the building. After a five-year halt, work restarted. Following Niemeyer's original designs, the building was completed and inaugurated in 1980. The party headquarters was a problem because of the limited space. In a case like this, the relationship between the volumes and the open spaces becomes fundamental. In fact, when there are too many volumes in a tight space, there is no longer an architectural spectacle. It all gets ugly. As I wanted to give breadth to the hall for the working class, I was obliged to give it depth and dig into the ground to avoid overcrowding the terrain. Two 
To enter the party's building, you have to plunge into the ground, under the white canopy that was added at the last minute to indicate the very well-hidden door. You arrive not in the basement of an office block, but in an immense underground public area that Niemeyer called the lobby of the working class. It is impossible to tell that the greater part of the program is underground. Two thirds of the parcel is taken up by four subterranean floors, the hidden face of party life. The working class lobby is a huge hall, a crossroads organized around three closed volumes, the stairs down from the esplanade, the lift wells, and the staircases for the building. All the walls enclosing the lobby are curved, as is a circular wall around the offices beside the patio. There are no doors in it. Only by passing behind the concrete veils can the doors be seen. A fluid space organized around the armchairs designed by the architect and the concrete furnishings destined for exhibitions. An open area spaced by the four large pillars that support the building and by three concrete commas. This is a second load-bearing structure that supports beams hidden in the ceiling, which in turn take the weight of the concrete slabs forming the large esplanade. While the purpose of the working class lobby is wide open, the next level down is clearly defined by its functions. Technical zones, the cafeteria, vast corridors and their relaxation areas, and meeting rooms. The two largest rooms nest in an avoid shape. On one side, the conference room slopes gently to a symmetrical platform between two columns, black and white, classic. On the other side, the delegation room, a table with extraordinary angles. One of the curved walls is in raw concrete, covered in the same carpeting, the other wall and the floor meld. No main hall, but extremely generous public areas. The cafeteria and the corridors defined by curves. Only the concrete walls are lit. Plank marks, nail heads, pouring faults. Concrete is king. The architect stages his own architecture. This is what the French architect Jean de Roche, who worked with Niemeyer during the first construction period, called didactic architecture, raw materials to catalyze reflection. While our architects, like all those of our generation, were under the influence of Le Corbusier and his architecture, they gradually moved away, attracted by a freer architecture. They invited the reinforced concrete specialist to penetrate the fantasy world of free plasticity, obliging them to follow the architectural line fearlessly. The spans grow wider, the columns become thinner, architecture grows lighter.
completed in 1980 with the help of the young architect Jean Morlionnet. The white dome over the assembly room of the Central Committee is the highlight of the architectural composition. Interacting with the curves of the office building, it is planted in the middle of the slope, a simple shape that gives nothing away regarding its function, a concrete volume covered with resin and painted white. Without any opening, it is surrounded by a narrow skylight to let daylight into the basement area. Access is down the slight slope of the working class lobby, a final adjustment in levels so that the volume of the room, half inside and half out, does not rise too high in front of the glass facade. Seats and long white tables for 250 people. A platform overhung by a concrete wing that improves the acoustics but seems about to take off. And from floor to ceiling, one finish only, tens of thousands of white panels on metal fixings all around the room from top to bottom, creating a network like a spider's web. Each panel is set perpendicular to the next, a multiplicity that leads one to think the overall purpose was for a visual effect. By reflecting the light from the fluorescent tubes placed behind, light is diffused equally in all directions. But above all, it was the answer to the acoustic problems of this unusual volume. The concrete dome returns all sound to the same spot, unbearable. Clad with glass wool, the volume absorbs the sounds that no longer circulate, disagreeable. Adopted after trial and error and the engagement of a company stimulated by the technical challenge, the arrangement of small metal strips helps distribute the sound throughout the volume. Set in the sloping wall, the heavy doors cannot be opened by hand. They are operated by hydraulic pistons. You might think you are in a spaceship. Secrecy for the meeting is ensured. I am a human being like everyone else who likes to draw and becomes an architect. An architect who spends his life bent over a table, but who understands and repeats that life is more important than architecture. To provide architecture with the human content it lacks, it is important to take part in the political struggle. I also think of architecture as secondary in the unjust world in which we live. The dream still goes on. However, two floors are occupied by an e-commerce company, 
and the building is now used as location for films, fashion shows or advertising spots. A direct result of the slow decline of the Communist Party, which in 30 years has gone from 20 to 5% of the vote, but cannot think of leaving its own home with all that that represents. For some, the image of a political utopia. For all of us, an architectural utopia that unites France with Brazil, setting in the heart of old Paris the sensual curves of some of the finest architecture of the 60s.